Hey, Backward Compatible listeners, this is Chris. I'd like to apologize in advance for the less than ideal sound quality in this episode. We're not entirely sure what happened, but things should be back to normal in the next one, and we'll do our best to keep this from happening again in the future. For now, thanks for your understanding, and enjoy the show. Jim, you know, you being a huge fan of Batman, you like know all the different Batman properties and you follow the comics and stuff like that. Um, he is Batman. <laughs> he is Batman. You're not supposed uh, to say that. <laughs> what the hell? This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris have a roundtable discussion on Batman, the Telltale series. Plus, Persona 5 Impressions and Controversy, and Impressions from the Beta for Gwent, the Witcher card game. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 97 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And we've got an interesting media discussion for you today. We're going to be doing a roundtable discussion on Telltale's Batman. Um, this was a game that I talked a little bit about uh, a little while back. I think it was sometime last year that it came out, or at least that it finished. Um, and we have some, uh, some, this might be the first round table where we have mostly negative things to say about We're the game, We're going to tell think. tales. <laughs> yes, we will, I guess. Yeah, this one was actually a very fun experience for us mm-hmm. going through it. But, um, and I mean that because we all played it together. Mm-hmm. But it ended up taking on more of an MST3K vibe, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> After a little actually, while, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'll have some interesting things to say about it too from my perspective because I actually played it on my own before we all played it as a group. So I will be able you to were com- cheating on us. <laughs> we will be able to uh, compare and contrast experiences there. Uh, but first, we have some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. So I just recently picked up Persona 5, and uh, before I sort of dive into talking about that, I wanted to share just a, this kind of like weird experience I'm having where. Uh, for the past couple of weeks, I've been doing a lot of extra work uh, at home and over the weekends, so I haven't had a lot of time for gaming, and so by the time that I'm now getting back into gaming, um, I'm finding that I have a whole bunch of like these massive open-world sprawling RPGs that are just like queued up and waiting for me to play. <laughs> oh my. So I haven't played Horizon Zero Dawn yet. Uh, I haven't played... Uh, I'm going to be trying out Mass Effect Andromeda. Um, which is another, you know, large game. Oh, you can knock that one out in three, four hours before you quit. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, you can just you can pass on that one. It's fine. You're good. <laughs> um, and you've got Nier. Yeah, Nier. I need to play Nier. I'll be talking um, about that one next week for sure. Yep. Um, and now Persona 5 is another one. So, yeah. I mean, I, I have uh, Legend of Zelda I still haven't finished playing yet. So there's all these different games. It's like, oh, man, I want to get around to playing this. And so if you're sort of focusing on one for it, but you start to feel guilty and like, okay, I need to stop playing this one so I can switch over to this one, it's just like... Chill out. <laughs> the Chris, one does not merely walk out of Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm with you on that. I had the same... I mean, I bought Persona 5. I haven't played it yet because mm-hmm. uh, I'm wanting to finish up Nier. And I felt the same way. I, I'm like, well, you know, i, I got to finish Nier. I don't want mm-hmm. to cheat on Nier before I go go over to Persona 5. So Yep. Uh, so anyway, speaking of Persona 5, um, I'm actually really impressed with it so far. Uh, they sort of... Um, they keep this sort of Atlas art style that is um, fairly well known for all their games. It actually uh, kind of reminds me more of uh, Catherine uh, stylistically than it does of, say, Persona 4. You're because kidding. Catherine was um, on the PS3, so it had you know the higher uh, resolution models and yeah, all that true, sort of stuff. True. I think that the art, to me, reminds me of something like... Um Death Note, mm-hmm. or like you know, like certain certain um, animes, anime, mm-hmm. animes. Yeah, it's more cel shaded. NMI, NMI. Um, so it actually fits better like, with their. Um, they have occasionally like animated cutscenes where it's actually just like hand drawn anime cutscenes. Uh-huh. Um, and so the it's still 3D when you're not in those modes, but it, it sort of fits the aesthetic a little bit better. Hmm. Um, but definitely. Uh, does some interesting stuff with the Persona formula. I was asked at one point um, if it's a good one to get in on, and I would say from a gameplay perspective, and I'll explain why here in a minute, I think it's probably 
the the best and most well refined take on Persona there's been so it, far. So it, definitely a good one to jump in on. They're also all standalone games too. They are all I mean, standalone games, but this one is different enough and like it does some things. It, it twists the formula a little bit in some oh, yeah. ways that I think you kind of want to play at least one of the other ones first before. Um, you go to this one because it is so different. So one of the key differences is in the other ones you're basically playing more or less is um, heroes who, you know, this this crisis has sort of come upon them and they have to react to it. And so, like, you're kind of um, becoming, you know, um, a defense force of sorts or you're becoming detectives or whatever the case might be. Uh, in this one, you're actually thieves. You're, you're what are called um, phantom thieves. And uh, you're a little bit more proactive as opposed to things sort of happening to you that you're reacting to. Um, you, you are sort of in a way like kind of left with no other choice than to do what you're doing. But you are actually going out and you're stealing things rather than um, just trying to like rescue someone or something like that. Got to steal to eat and got to eat to live, man. <laughs> something like that. Uh, you're, actually, you're actually going into people's cognition and you're stealing um, their desires. Um, it's complicated. Oh, I played that when it was called Psychonauts. <laughs> Actually, that's not not a bad not a bad comparison. Yeah. Um, so, because of the different uh, twists that they kind of have on the the formula and the aesthetic, I think it's worth um, even if you don't finish the other games, playing some of them to get enough of a feel for them that you can sort of appreciate what they're doing differently. Um, definitely a really good game so far. They've really refined a few of the gameplay and mechanics. And one of the things I'm actually most impressed with is when you go into these dungeons, they're no longer procedurally generated. Um, whereas before, you kind of like went floor to floor, and each floor was kind of you know procedurally generated the map uh this one is actually a designed dungeon where they've got like a specific layout and different things are put in different rooms and that sort Mm -hmm. of stuff and they do a lot of cool things to actually encourage you to make a little bit of progress and then leave and then come back and do a little bit more progress and then leave um for example in order to um open locked treasure chests, you have to actually build lock picks outside which the materials to build the lock picks are usually found inside the dungeon and you can only build so many at a time and so you actually like go in, you'll get the stuff, and you'll find the chests, come back, build the lock picks, and then go back the next time and remember where the chest was and you go unlock it. Um, you know, there's like kind of, you'll explore and you'll sort of secure a route, as they call it, where you can, um, each time you get to a saving spot, that's a place that you can warp to. Um, and so basically you have an incentive to be like, if I'm running low on energy and I don't have the stuff to sort of keep myself going, um, then it's like, okay, I've gone far enough tonight that I feel I can, can go ahead and... Um, I can go ahead and, you know, leave now, rest up, come back, you know, fresh with the, the ability to use all my special powers and stuff like that again. Well, so so that's that's the dungeon aspect of it. Mm-hmm. But the Persona games also have that that high school interaction, mm-hmm. character um, relationship leveling up, I guess is the best way to mm-hmm. sort of put that. Yeah, that's so still does, present. That's still all present in the yep. game as well. And that, that works largely the same. Uh, again, they kind of... It's interesting because there's this motif they use of a tarot deck, and each character is kind of represented by a different tarot card. Hmm. Um, so, like, there's the chariot, there's the hierophant, there's death, there's all these different and things. And they've been using that theme, I th- believe, since the first one. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they I have. haven't actually played the very first um, one. But... And so it's always interesting to see which card they kind of assign to which character or vice versa. Uh, so it's like, oh, this person is that archetype in this game. But there's always, like, a little bit of a different twist. And this one definitely has this theme of... Um, Rebellion and kind of like breaking the rules of society and stuff like that. Because essentially, you're not bad guys, but you've been labeled as bad guys because you don't fit in or something. Wait, 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 hold on a second. Like the A team. Right, yes, like the A team. Yeah. Not like um, the A team. Yeah. So what's the deal with like are, you're thieves, right? Mm-hmm. So how are, you're breaking the law? Yeah. Well, you're you're go- basically going <laughs> into, right. Or like I said, you're going into people's cognition. And so I'll I'll just give an example. There's this teacher who sort of sees himself as the king of this school because he's a a uh, former Olympic gold medalist, um, and now he's the the volleyball coach, and um, he's kind of abusing his power. And so, what you're doing is you're actually going into his mind, and so in his mind, the school is visualized as a castle, hmm. and he has all these you know there's all these guards patrolling, and that's what you're fighting to try to get through. There's a little bit of a stealth element, which is kind of neat. Um, uh, I'm picturing that old man coach from Dodgeball. <laughs> <laughs> Does the art style change through this? Uh, it's it's still recognizably Persona. No. Are, are you talking about like from a, from Dream to Dream? Um, it does as far as, like, the, the level design is very different. So, oh, okay. like, you know, in the real world, everything looks very realistic, and mm-hmm. the castle world looks very fantasy. Um, and in some cases, like Persona 4, for example, there was this one level where you're exploring the cognition of this um, gamer type. Yeah, who, I was thinking of that level. Yeah, and it's all very 16-bit and stuff like that. Oh, so okay. they, they, they specifically modeled that off of 
uh, Dragon Quest aesthetics on purpose. Oh, really? It's such a well-known Japanese RPG, oh, and you're supposed to be a big fan. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's good. It sounds like a good game, though. Yeah, no, I'm, re I'm really impressed have, with it so Have far. you failed your entrance exams or any of your exams yet? No, I haven't gotten to exams yet, no. Really? Oh. <laughs> have you tried renting videos? Um, I've heard this is a thing, where you can actually, like, watch episodes of uh, Guy, uh, what's it? It's not MacGyver, but Guy Macver, and it's like a whole episode. What? And it's based on a real MacGyver episode. Wait, why would there be a MacGyver joke in a Japanese RPG. Well, there's tons of them. That's my point. Is it? Is well, it, I was going to actually say it's this. It's like uh, this big, long... A lot of the, uh, the personas that they have, and there's some recurring personas, too, from the mm -hmm. other games, mm -hmm. but um, the personas that your characters have this time, usually that kind of reflects the themes of that game, and so I mentioned the theme of rebellion in this one. So you start off, like, the main character's persona to begin with is um, uh, Thief Lupin, um, Arsene Lupin, or whatever. Yeah, Lupin Loop on the third, yeah. Um, they also have um, uh, Carmen from the play is one of the characters. Um, I love Carmen's music. Uh, Captain Kidd no. uh, is one of the guys. Um, and so there's kind of these themes of, like, if you know their backstories, like Captain Kidd is this notorious pirate, but some people see him as being unjustly labeled as this notorious pirate. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, and so they kind of have this thing of, if you know the stories of these characters, like, they're these famous rebels who kind of with a just cause most of the time. I get it. And that's kind of a big theme of this particular So game. I assume there's a Robin Hood related. Probably at some point, yeah. So yeah, I uh, definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, like I said, it, it's it's a standalone game, and it's definitely worth getting if you're interested in Persona at all. It's a great place to jump in. But if you have the ability to check out, say, three or four beforehand, even if you don't finish them, just kind of get, get a feel for Persona and then see how this one twists it. Um, I think it's a really... Uh, interesting juxtaposition. Well, I was interested until you said I had to do that. <laughs> yeah, just just pick it up and play it. Don't, yeah. don't overthink it, guys. <laughs> don't overthink it. It's time to hashtag get wrecked with some talk about competitive multiplayer games. Doc, are you ready to hashtag get wrecked? I'm always ready to <laughs> hashtag get wrecked, Jim. Uh, yes. I want to talk about Gwent. Gwent? Um, yeah, you know what Gwent is. Of course. I mean, I, the, obviously, card, the card game from Witcher 3. Obviously, yeah. Jim, you would know what Gwent is. Mm -hmm. You're the one who loaned me your copy of mm -hmm. Witcher 3. Um, but I've been in the beta for the standalone game of Gwent. And the first thing I want to report is it's almost a uh, direct translation over. In all the ways that matter, it is. Mm -hmm. And so it's still Gwent, and it's still there, and it's Gwent. Now, at what point can you, if you're losing a game... Mm -hmm quit out of the game, stand up, and then pull out one of your giant swords and like slice the guy in two? Is that still That would thing? be in the category of features that are not quite oh, there. Oh, okay. <laughs> they didn't make the trends. That was one of my favorite features. Uh, right. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that may have... So uh, Hearthstone has their emotes, and in Gwent, the emotes is to get up and just slice the other person. <laughs> <in that. laughs> yeah. uh, well, actually, there are emotes in this, among other things, and they do them well. I think this is a game that has learned from interactive online card games. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, it takes the right things, not all the things, but the right things from games like Hearthstone. It's the right. obvious comparison. But it is still fundamentally unto itself Gwent. So what you've got is the three rows on either side. You're building your deck, very, very small deck, as it always mm -hmm. has been. And you're drawing the cards. You're deciding whether to throw three back or not. And then you're playing them. And you've got three rounds, up to three rounds. And you have to win two of them to win the whole match. But there's a lot of little things that are just subtly in there. For example, you've got dailies. And the dailies are win rounds. Not full matches, but rounds. So even if you win one of three, you still have helped move towards your daily. That's a tiny little example of ways that they're very intelligently keeping the player interested and engaged in what's going on. Now, as one would expect, you're going to get cards as you go. But the way that it works is you get scraps for winning, and you use the scraps to buy the cards you want and to basically create the cards you want as you go so that you can strategically build your deck the way you want to. It's not about random pulls. You're not opening packs, and you're not getting random cards, and you're not, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, there is some of that, a little bit, um, but you can very, again, strategically go in and get the, the, I think it was like Magic Dust or Mana or something like that in, in Hearthstone. But that kind of stuff is there. And you, it's the stuff you would expect to be there that's there. Now, what has changed is a little bit of the, uh, this is obviously a PvP kind of uh, uh, situation. Well, obviously. CVC. C, C, C. Well, okay. card, card versus card. 
Well, no. <laughs> what I mean is... <laughs> Whatever you say, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is you're not playing versus the computer. Now. Right, now, right. You can, uh, but, you know, it, it, ultimately, you're playing versus the AI in all of which are three, obviously. Here, you've got a real human on the other mm -hmm. end, and that changes a few minor things. So what you've got to do, you've got to uh, strategize with new... Uh, new ways to play those cards. And there's a few tiny mechanic changes that are, are worth mentioning. For example, um, whenever, whenever you used to play the Hornblower, you remember that one? This was a key card. You mm -hmm. almost always brought it in. You almost always used it. What did it do? Do you remember? I didn't play that much. Glenn. Oh, really? You I think it, I, I want to say the Hornblower got, like, dispelled whatever environment effect was going no, on. No, no, that was Clear Skies. Oh, that was but Clear Actually, skies. that's a great example, okay. too. I'll get to that in a second. Um, no, the Hornblower was a modifier. Basically, he doubled uh, everything on that row. Oh, right, okay. So that was okay. a little too powerful. I remember that. So basically, what they've done is they've nerfed that card a little bit. Now what you do is it's going to um, give a bonus of plus three to up to three cards on the row. And then there's a different sort of category of that, which gives a, a bonus to up to five on a row. So now you're thinking in terms of, hmm, do I want to play this? I've only got four on the row. Subtle changes like that. Mm -hmm. And really what it's doing is, is it's making the PvP environment a little bit more robust, shall we say. Now, let's talk about the weather. You can't play a game of uh, Gwent in Witcher 3 without weather coming up. Right. Uh, I a would big say, part of it. Yeah, it's a huge part of it. I would say that the majority of the weather effects are not really being used in the PvP environment um, just because they're, they're different now. A lot of them, um, the cards either have weather immunity or they have a bonus. For example, I love my monster deck. I absolutely love the monster. And, and one of the reasons that I kept playing in Witcher 3 was just to have a qualifying monster deck so that I could play with a monster deck. Um, I got to start with a monster deck this time. You can start with any of the five decks that you start with. Mm. Um, and so it was great because I had the starting monster deck, came out, and, and the very first thing I did was I played Fog, and boom, all of these little Fog monsters came out. Like they were, the ones that were in my deck just popped out onto the screen. Now, maybe that was an original thing, maybe it's not. I never got far enough in Witcher 3's Gwent to know that, even though I played many, many hours yeah. of Gwent. Um, what I love about this is it's just meaty, grindy, in a good way, Gwent. It is pure Gwent. And in that sense, I think they've done a fantastic job of it. I've watched some of the updates, uh, little things like, hey guys, now you can play a card anywhere in the row you want to, instead of it playing automatically all the way the farthest on the right. So they're listening to the players. This is not just about them saying, um, oh yeah, we've got this thing on the list and we'll get to it. It's, it's players going, wow, I really wish you could. And them going, that's a great idea. That's really smart because that actually is one of the big things that made uh, World of Warcraft so successful was yes. Blizzard listening to their player base. Absolutely. And encouraging the players to give them feedback and then incorporating as much of that feedback as they could into the game. Um, and so I, I'm, I, I, it sounds great to me that CG, CG Project Red is doing that because... You know, Blizzard doesn't. Blizzard does not really make video games so much anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> they've kind of gone the way of, of Steam as well as like yeah. they, they kind of have games that are just sort of persistent and they don't really make too many new products. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that CD Projekt Red is sort of taking up that banner. Would you expect anything else from them though? No, honestly, they, they really those they've guys been are awesome. known. Yeah, they've been known for as a development team that listens to yeah. fans, incorporates feedback. Uh, but also is willing to stick by their guns, too. Like, when they feel mm -hmm. like they have a good product or they feel like we went the right direction with this, you know, they'll stick to that and they'll yeah. defend their games, which is yeah, like Rockstar does as well. So I have a lot of respect for CG, CG Project Red, even though they're relatively new developers, yeah. you know, in the space, yeah. if you think about it. But I think they've, they've shown their, uh, their moxie, if you will, cool. at this point. Honestly, I don't know what else to say except maybe that uh, one of the biggest changes in the game is that you can actually damage cards, but it's not through a fight action, it's through the play action. It's always things that uh, trigger whenever you play the card. So if I have a siege weapon that I throw down, I can actually deal three damage, for example, to a non-gold card, right? And so that, in that sense, it's, it enriches the strategy just a little bit more. Mm. It's not just about when I play this, it's about when I play it to bring you down to give that psychological trigger of, okay, now I pass. Because the game of Gwent is always about passing at the right time. Always. And it's still about that. And so I love it. Uh, I think they've done a, a really great job. Cool. I mean, I'm glad. I, I, hope, I hope it's very successful. Not a huge fan of all these card games that come out, but uh, I, I'm, I, I like that you know, they're, they're scratching that itch and they're getting some... Yeah. You know, I have a lot of hope success. for it. I, 
I burned out on Hearthstone because it was just too much creep, and I invested all this time and energy into getting deck that I really liked, and then suddenly, oh, no, your deck's invalid because of the new thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really hoping that Gwent does not go that direction, but even if it does, it's a few years out. Yeah. And so right now, um, you know, I mean, it's crazy. You can actually look for hard copy cards of, of Gwent, all the, all the cards that were in the game, mm -hmm. and get yourself a deck and get yourself a board, and you can play Gwent analog on a table. It costs about 120 bucks to do this. And um, there's a lot of uh, you know, tokens that go out and modifying and that sort of a thing, because Gwent's always been about you know, modifying cards, and, and, and there's a lot of math involved. So it wasn't designed to do that, but you can do it. And the reason you can do it is it's a fixed set of cards. It's always been that way. It's extremely well-balanced. They mm -hmm. know the product that, it, that they're selling. And yet, at the same time, that idea of um, gaining the cards, winning the cards, that kind of a thing, it's preserved. I love it. Mm -hmm. and, and unlike in the game, in the real world, you don't have to go to a swamp and kill like a dirty hag in order to get one of your Gwent cards. No, you can right? You could. Yeah, it's, it's an option. Yeah. Yeah. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. So since we've been talking about Persona 5, I did want to talk about just a little bit of gaming controversy in this gaming meta segment Ooh. related to Persona 5, uh, spe specifically Atlas. Um, they've been banning streamers from streaming the game itself, Persona 5. Mm. They've been, of course, they, they initially it was revealed that they don't allow you to use the share button in, in PS4, mm -hmm. but it's gone beyond that. It's it's all footage in terms of uh, whether it's a live stream or a Let's Play or something. They've Wait, been why would they do that? Very restrictive. Why are they doing yeah, that? Yeah, why would they do that? Um, well, there's a, there's a lot of different ideas about that, and some say that it's related to spoilers. Uh, they don't want people to, if they think that it could ruin the experience. Um, Chris has another idea that I think is interesting. Yeah, so I think the official line is that it, it is in the interest of storytelling. Right. They, they want to have the storytelling experience be a natural one and for okay. you to experience it. Um, but I, I don't know, and this is just a random guess, but, you know, given all the different controversy there's been lately um, over the past couple of years about, like, you know, misogyny in games and all this different stuff, um, which we're not going to get too much into right now, mm -hmm. There is, in the very first dungeon that I mentioned earlier, I, mean, I, I talked about that teacher who is, you know, abusing his power and stuff like that. Um, and one of the bigger themes in that particular segment is sexual harassment. Um, he's sexually harassing a lot of his students. Um, and so, like, you know, it's definitely portrayed as this is the bad guy, and, you know, it's definitely not a case of, um, you know, like, the, the male protagonist saving the, the female victim or whatever, because there's actually a female protagonist who is the most worried about her female friend who's going through some of this. Um, and so I think they handle it in a very good, responsible way. Mm -hmm. um, but I could see how there might be a little bit of concern of people who just sort of happen to see on a stream some of this stuff happening. And they're like, oh, man, this is terrible. How can you possibly put this in your game? And they're trying to avoid the sort of, if you're going to see that, they want you to have experienced it through the game. In context. In context. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's the case, but that's kind of a thing that struck me it, when I heard about this. I mean, I don't, to me, that seems like the, the sort of thing that a Western game developer yeah. would be concerned with and do. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't think that's the case, because Japanese develop. this is just my observation, mm -hmm. but, um, but here's the question Japanese game development, well, is how are they blocking the streaming and stuff like that in Japan? Have they been doing this just as aggressively as they are now that it's been released in the U.S.? Oh, good question. Well, it's been released worldwide, too. Mm -hmm. So it was I think, it a because I thought it came out in Japan a while back, and not, now it's getting it, it was. It went out, I think, I want to say, like, four or five months ago mm -hmm. in Japan. Um, so it's been out there for a while, and they had always restricted the uh, the PS4 sharing feature. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's as big of a, uh, at least from what I've seen, I don't think that the Let's Play community is as huge. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't think they needed to. Whereas yeah. when, it, when it went worldwide, there's so many in the U.S. and um, Europe. Like, Let's Players are huge. Like, you think of all the big Let's Players, um, you know, they could tend to be from places in Europe or in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So I think it was just there wasn't a need to then, but they but they had always been planning to do that because they had always restricted the game with the share button on, on the PS4. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it was a concern from the start, but I don't think it was for... I mean, the reason you say makes does make sense. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it doesn't make sense from a PR perspective. Sure. Some companies might have that concern, mm -hmm. um, but I think that's a very like Western way to look at it. A lot mm -hmm. of Japanese devs take that other route where they just kind of say... Well, here's the game that we made. If you don't like it, just don't buy it. Yeah. Kind of like yeah. feeling, which I, I really respect that attitude. Because mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the way I feel with it. If you're going to be offended by something, mm -hmm. well, maybe you, it's just not for you. Mm -hmm. You know, 
go up, grow up and go outside. It's just a game, guys. Just well, video it, games. it could also be to a certain extent a little bit of a, a cultural difference. Like you, you mentioned, you know, let's plays aren't necessarily quite as prevalent mm. um, over there. And also, like you know, um, Steins Gate Zero, a visual novel, yeah. also has the share the share function on the play, PlayStation Four blocked like for most of the game. And that's a very that's a that's an even more story heavy game. Yeah, exactly. and so I think a lot of this could just be. From the Japanese perspective, they don't understand why somebody would take a story game mm-hmm. and stream it like that. Like, I do think that's a thing. I think that mm-hmm. they just don't see... And I'm kind of, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm kind of with that community when it comes to... I don't get why you would want to watch someone play mm-hmm. a stream of a story of story heavy game. The only you reason know, I could see sense. myself wanting to is say, like, I own a PC and an Xbox, but I don't own a PlayStation. I can't afford a PlayStation. And this is a PS4 exclusive. And so I want to experience the game, but I know I can't play it. Okay, so here's that's exactly why they would want to ban it, though. Mm-hmm. Because the whole point of the game that you're going to buy the game is so you can go through the story. Yeah. If you can just watch it on YouTube, you don't have to buy the game. Yep. So it's like you're basically giving away your game for free. It'd be like if, if a new movie is coming out in theaters, mm-hmm. and then someone goes goes into the theater, records the, records the, the movie, and then sticks it up on YouTube mm-hmm. and goes, Hey, guys. What's wrong? I can't stream the movie. I'm just streaming the movie. It's a let's watch. It's a let's you know. What I mean? but you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you see my point? I know it seems like it, it seems ridiculous because we're so used to let's plays. Mm-hmm. But the the truth of the matter is that that this is still gaming is still a business. Mm-hmm. They're trying to sell their product, and if they feel that the like they don't have enough when it comes to it's not so much the gameplay that they're trying to pull you in on. It's it is the gameplay, but it's also the story and the way that's told sure. and that kind of thing. And that if that's if you can just experience that devoid of any of the play, yeah. then you don't need to buy the game. If they, if they feel that way, now I'm not even saying that's true, but I'm saying if, from a business perspective, if that's what they think, then of course they're going to ban it, and why shouldn't they? Mm-hmm. Right? Sure. I don't really see it as a bad th- bad move, which, you know, and, and I, I actually, I follow, I, I'm in touch with a lot of, or I try to stay in touch with a lot of, you know, gaming, mm-hmm. uh, gaming com- community and gaming culture um, controversies and problems, and mm-hmm. a lot of times I will kind of, you know, latch on and go, yeah, all these companies are making this bigger. Oh, yeah, they shouldn't be doing this, or that kind of thing, and I'll can have some pretty strong opinions, but this time I just don't get it. I just don't get what the outrage is I, about. I don't. I don't really see. <laughs> I don't see why it is even an argument, unless agency. The idea of me being able to make a meaningful personal decision as I'm playing this game. The, the key verb here is playing. I'm not just an audience who is mm-hmm. watching. I am a. I am a player who is engaging, interacting, right? That's the uh, interaction mm-hmm. is what makes video games video games. So if if I can watch the entire game be played by somebody else and still want to play the game, then that's that that's a reason to stream and I think that's the whole point behind streaming. If instead the idea of the, there being streams out there is going to cut into your sales, something has changed in the player base. Um, now, I think well, we also tend to forget that streaming is actually really, really new and sort of experimental. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it's entirely possible that this is just a pushback, which may or may not be well-received. It may sure. or may not sure. uh, mean something. It may or may not and, and, and people you know, have made a harbinger. That, right. And people have made that point, too, where they've said some people, some people like to watch, even though they've already played the game or they plan to play the game. Mm-hmm. So they're like, oh, they don't care about spoilers, and they're still, they want to play it, and they yeah. want to experience it there. And I'm sure that's the case. Or they're watching for the personality of the streamer, like they want to see how this person reacts to exactly. the game. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. But I also but I also can see the side of it from the developer too. Mm-hmm. Because that's it really right. depends on the game that you're doing. And when you have games where it's very much story based mm-hmm. and you're just gonna be playing those those moments that are moments that are essentially non interactive or minimal interaction, then yeah, I mean you're kind of giving that away. Why would mm-hmm. you want to give that away? This week's meaty topic of discussion. All right, so roundtable on uh, Telltale's Batman uh, series. Um, this is one that I remember uh, a while back. I talked about um, having played the first couple episodes. The first one I thought started off decently strong. Uh, second one was okay, um, and then I didn't end up talking about the uh, three through five because I didn't get around to it for a few months. And when I did, I was not incredibly impressed. Um, but I wanted to all do a roundtable on this, uh, playing together via the crowdplay feature, which is the first game that they've introduced crowdplay into. Now the idea there is that uh, everyone logs into um, a, 
uh, basically, like, they go on their phones, they pull up their web browser. It doesn't have to be your phone, I guess. Uh, but there's a URL that's shown up in the corner of the screen when you turn CrowdPlay on. And so while someone's controlling the game like normal with their controller, everyone else is able to uh, vote on basically what they're saying. Uh, and you can actually see, like, you know, their names pop up next to the choice that says, like, oh, uh, Jim and Doc wanted to do this thing, or but, uh, you know, Chris and Nick wanted to say something else. And so we actually had Nick, he joined us to uh, play a little bit of this when we were all over at my, uh, my place checking this out. And I think that in principle, it, it, it's a cool idea and it works decently well, but I think there were some pretty major failings that I think we can talk about too. For example, um, some of the biggest choices that happen in the game, um, they don't have the players like push the buttons for combat sequences. Right. When you're on the phone, they just have you choose dialogue options. And so there are a few times, for example, when a choice comes down to, do you want to give this information to so-and-so or to so-and-so? And that's actually something where the main player moves their stick to the left or the right to choose one of those kind of as almost like in-world UI elements. Um, and so the player or the the other the rest of the players don't get any say on that. I, I think what this boils down to is they didn't they really should have incorpor- like they tried to incorporate these little action segments because it's Batman into the game as well. So you have things like oh you need to. Um, punch this guy and then uh, uh, avoid this guy who's going to run at you and charge at you and you have to like you're about to fall off a cliff where well, you got to hit this button to grab the ledge so they add these little like semi action sequences that are basically just uh, QTEs you know quick time events mm-hmm. that's really all they are and they're not things that you vote on and they're not really taking advantage of their system which mm-hmm. is really a narrative choice based system you're being kind Jim they're broken right it is broken but I, I'm trying to be the most um, um, diplomatic about I, it I'm not going to be diplomatic they but, were broken yeah. but and, they were and and so a lot of these like really kind of dragged on and so yes, like, it's not that fun for the players controlling it and it's really boring for everyone and, else and my, yeah. my other thought on here too it's not just about the crowd play element I mean mm-hmm. it is because being able to vote on those those moments like for example the um, the combat sequences if it was because you're Batman mm-hmm. you know you're, you're going to be a badass let's not throw in some failure. This is not an action game. Mm-hmm. So it could be something like, are you going to um, you're going to kick this guy? Are you going to grab this guy? Are you going to like drop a smoke pellet and disappear and like try to stealth around? Like, How are you going to handle this situation? Mm-hmm. You're Batman. You have all these different options, right? Did I mention you're Batman? I think I said I'm that. Batman. Right. So, but you're all Batman. We're all Batman. So, <laughs> so that's kind of my point. It's These should be, be handled in the same way, where you're choosing between um, typically four, but you know, four different options of what you can do, maybe maybe less depending on the situation. And when you go into a crowd play situation, that's where that becomes a voting. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, I, I felt it I found it very odd that it kept slipping into these different um mechanics that doesn't work with the engine they're using. And that's mm-hmm. another thing that we can talk about yeah. too when it comes to the engine, because they're still using the same engine, at least it seems to be the same engine that they were using for uh, The Walking Dead. Mm-hmm. Technically they did ago. they did update the engine, but it's more from like a graphical perspective. They haven't changed if you if what you mean by engine is like, you know, style of play, then no, they haven't updated that. Yeah. I, I, I thought it was literally the same engine. But mm-hmm. but yeah, I guess it may have made some updates to it graphically, but um, Essentially, you're doing the same things. It's functioning the same way, mm-hmm. and it doesn't really look that that much that good either. I mean, it's, it looks like it's a couple of generations behind, and I do mean a couple. I mean, it looks like PS2 level. It's also not super optimized. No, so. it actually to me it looks more like PS3, um, and like I can kind of see where like oh yes, they have more shading things and they have more polys and all this different stuff, but they um, they didn't apparently do a ton of like it runs terribly on my PC, which is actually why I, I rebought it for the PS4 at one point. Um, and it, uh, on the PS4, it still has a few issues with, you know, the frame rate dropping and that sort of stuff. Yeah, they, they didn't it, really optimize. It, it's, it's odd how it's so poorly optimized as well, because there's not a whole lot going on. So it's not like, oh, there's, there has to be all of these particles on screen at once, and there's all these things happening, because it's like this massive action game where you're fighting, like, hundreds of enemies. No, you, that's not happening. So why is, why is it struggling so much yeah, to do much almost nothing? Yeah, they're pretty much interactive cutscenes. Right. So how is it struggling this much? You know, it's, it's yeah. like, literally one of the worst times that we experienced this was actually we were inside the um, crime alley, mm-hmm. which is very well named, as Doc aptly pointed out. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like, why would people go to this alley? It's freaking crime alley. Maybe you shouldn't walk down crime alley. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was Bruce's parents' first mistake. So, yeah, let's take this shortcut through uh, crime alley. Well, it wasn't always called crime alley, was it? Yeah, well, it was I crime I'm, alley, I'm, and then it right. got abbreviated. And, of course, I'm kidding. It became known as crime alley because <laughs> of the crime, but still. Um, but we were inside Crime Alley, and all we were doing was we were, we were supposed to be investigating uh, the crime, which, by the way, this is weird, too. You're investigating the crime of his parents, and so mm-hmm. Batman, Bruce Wayne, as an adult, 
is investigating a crime scene that happened like 15 years ago. Yeah, very cold case. Mm -hmm. And we're really supposed to believe, like, I understand he's Batman, all right? He's Batman, mm -hmm. but this, is a, this case is as cold as he can possibly get. There's no way there's going to be evidence mm -hmm. that he could possibly find. How many crimes? First of all, it's called Crime Alley. Mm -hmm. not, like, well, not, not like one crime happened here ever. <laughs> so, of course, there's going to be tons of evidence for well, all sorts I, of crimes. I think what he was doing is not looking for evidence. He was trying to remember that night. He was and triggering so, his memories. Yeah. yeah, he was. It's just... That's ridiculous. I think one of the reasons, though, that it might have been so laggy. In but, yeah, it was laggy in that particular thing. Because it, it was... You're just was, walking around. It was actually way worse in the PC version when I tried it. Oh, wow, um, and granted, really? like, I, I don't have, like, a hardcore gaming PC. It's definitely out of date. You don't need a hard... You should um, need a hardcore gaming PC to play this, <laughs> though. Yeah, That's I the But I, I think what might have happened is they might have... Because when you go into the past, there's kind of, like, the sort of blue... Um, tone filter they put on everything. And so I have a feeling that what they were doing is they actually had two different environments running simultaneously that they're cutting between um, rather than like loading and then reloading or just adding a post-processing effect to it in order to make that work. So I have a feeling that it was because they're running two environments simultaneously. Just not, not optimized, like you said mm -hmm. before. Yeah. So, so let's talk some about the way that the game, the game actually plays itself. Like how, does it, how does it work? Well, so, and that's uh, what I meant by it was broken. Yeah. Uh, because I was the guy who had the controller, and uh, there were times whenever I chose not to push the buttons. I literally set the controller down mm -hmm. on the coffee table and did nothing. And the game just played itself, and, giving the illusion that I had hit the button. Yeah, and to be clear, he's referring to the, the, the quick time of the, the QTEs, extensions, the yeah. QTEs. Um, until uh, it, it seemed extremely arbitrary. I could not figure out the pattern. Until it got to this sort of threshold of critical mass where it failed, and then it was a game over. Mm -hmm. it, not, it, was, it, was, it was a weird situation, because remember weird. how we, we were testing it, too, because this, this was, by the way, this is how we had to have fun with the game. We'll get to that in a bit, because <laughs> yeah. we weren't enjoying the game itself. So we were having fun trying to figure out when, or, when it was going to kill us and when it was going to do it for us automatically. Yeah. But sometimes they would, there'd be a really long fight scene where there were all these little, like, punch, you know, you have to punch and kick and dodge and all that, and you have a short little period to hit, hit the X button or the O button in order to succeed. But... We could we put our controller down. It would play through the whole segment. Wouldn't no game over. Then there were other parts where it was literally just um, in the middle of that long sequence. You could not touch your controller, and then like part way through, if you miss this one move, yeah, you better you lose. Quick. But then the, right after that, the next move, you, it, it just goes back on autopilot. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really arbitrary to where um, you know why why do that? Why not either have them all be dangerous situations or like i was saying before just let the player choose mm -hmm. how they're going to approach the situation yeah. and then watch it play out to kind of summarize uh in you know a way that might make it a little bit easier to understand what we mean by this if instead of saying um press x to go left if the game was more about are you going to go left or are you going to go right yeah um and that like it's constantly preventing it presenting you with either a and b or maybe a b c or yeah. however many choices but it's always about how are you going to handle this and maybe you can even have a cool thing where uh, depending on, like, your style, you know, your reputation as Batman changes. Like, there's this one place where um, you're interrogating a guy, and so are you going to actually beat him up, or are you just going to intimidate him? And, you know, they, they say that, that they'll... break his arm for one of those. Mm -hmm. Like, one of your options was actually just to break his arm. Yeah. Uh, and so you can choose to break his arm or to not break his arm. Um, and then they'll note, like, your violent or nonviolent approach. Well, but then they didn't. Yeah. Do you remember? But, yeah, we, we, yeah. we did that and, for one of I, them. I mentioned this in my initial yeah. impressions, is that the uh, Alfred kind of berates you uh, and says, like, you know, don't lose your way and don't become the bad guy. And, like, you, think, you beat the man half to death. It's like, I barely touched him when I played it. Right. Uh, and this one, we actually did beat him up, so it made more sense. But, you know, we, we talked about when we did um, uh, Tales, uh, Tales from the Borderlands uh, how great we thought the Telltale model was done in that one. Absolutely. Um, where it, it gave you good feedback. It acknowledged what it was you were doing. And in this one, there were so many times when it didn't acknowledge what the player was doing that it really started, like, this was the Telltale model done poorly. Yeah. So if you kind of yeah. want, if you want counterexamples, Batman was Telltale done poorly, Tales and Borderlands was done excellently. So yeah, I, I, I can't really comment on that one because I didn't play it. Mm -hmm. but the two that I would say were done very well were, were the first season of Walking Dead and then um, The Wolf Among Us. Wolf yes. Among Us. Yes. yes. The Wolf Among Us was, was, also The Wolf Among Us probably had the best use of their graphical system mm -hmm. as well. Um, just the visuals. But yeah, I think that Telltale has fallen into this trap where they have a formula they're going to try to follow every time, and they can only deviate so much when it comes to story choices. I mean, I, I understand that you can do that a little bit, but they don't want, it seems like they're not willing or able to create the content to have true branching stories, and they haven't really from the beginning, even, even Walking no, Dead. No, the didn't. model they use is a bottleneck story, and that's right. okay. So they have to kind of essentially trick you into believing that you have choice. You give you false choices. Right. 
but and Batman, that's okay too Batman if you don't realize it. Right, but Batman, it was very clear, pretty much from the very start, that these were all false choices. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there was no sense of illusion. There was, there was no real illusion that we, we had any sort of impact on what was going on. Mm-hmm. Um, you can do some interesting stuff later um, in, like, you know, the, the last few episodes where you can sort of change. Um, for example, in episode five, like, you, you have two villains that you can confront. You can actually change the order in which you do them, and depending on which order you do, will change a few things in that scene. Like, some things are allowed to transpire that might not. Do, do we want to talk some, way. since we're talking about the villains, do we want to talk some about the characters and the story and the way that they incorporate the Batman mythos? Because, and this is something, actually, that I was interested in talking about. Yeah. Right. Um, because I noticed that, Jim, you know, you being a huge fan of Batman, you, like, know all the different Batman properties, and you follow the comics and stuff like that. Um, he is Batman. <laughs> he is Batman. You're not supposed uh, to say that. <laughs> what the hell? Bruce Wayne is actually just to cover for Jim. Uh, he, he's, the, he's the scapegoat that everyone thinks is Batman. Can I borrow 20 bucks? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, Bruce, Bruce still has all the money. Oh. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you were talking about how you didn't like, for example, um, the Penguin, how he was portrayed in this. Well, what, what got me with that, it's, and I've seen a lot of different portrayals in Batman, I think mm. it's important to point out that I am not one of these people that says... Well, this is the way the comics say it, so it must be exactly like the comics. Right, because even the comics will change it up. Exactly. I was yeah. going to make that point. This is a character that's been around since the late 1930s. So Danny DeVito is the only? <laughs> well, Burgess Meredith. I, I can't even finish that sentence. Burgess Meredith. But, <laughs> I'll uh, give you that one, yeah. actually. Yeah. No, but, but the point I'm trying to make is that, that Batman has changed a lot. There's a lot of different interpretations of these characters, but the key there is that they're different interpretations of the same character. That's right. Not completely original characters that we're just going to slap a name on and pretend like it's the same character. Those are two... Now, it seems like those are similar situations, but there's, there's, a, there's a difference there, and it's mm-hmm. important that we, that we point that out. To use an example, Gotham. Have you, uh, have you all seen Gotham at all? The, the TV, TV show. show. Yeah, yeah, the one that centers so, around the um, commissioner. Gordon. Really, yes. Uh, yeah. yes. And, uh, how many, have you watched a lot of those episodes? Actually, I haven't watched any of it. Okay. I, I just watched the pilot. So the reason why I want to bring that, that show up, and I actually think it's a pretty, a pretty good show. Not a great show. It's one mm-hmm. of those, like, you kind of have it on in the background, but there are some good performances. Or, like, you can watch the dishes it. while watching. Sure. Yeah. 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 It's not like a Better Call Saul where you have to put the yeah, no laser kidding. in. But, or the um, expanse. Right. So in Gotham, Robin Taylor, who portrays uh, the Penguin, um, Oswald Cobblepot, mm-hmm. he goes through this character um, development throughout the series where um, that, that I think makes it very, like, it pays homage to the character of the Penguin in the comics and shows how he develops into the Penguin, which is kind of the point of the Gotham series. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to show how did they become these characters right. and without actually just breaking who the character is. Sure. And so in this one, um, originally he's just this really kind of, like, he's conniving, but he's kind of a sniveling, you know, runt who's under this other crime boss. Mm-hmm. And he is just called the Penguin because they're making fun of him, and he hates it. But he, he has, like, no one really is, is afraid of him or anything. And he kind of develops over time into embracing this character and it becoming who he is, and he becomes... So he does become a killer, like a, hard, like a hardcore killer, but in a, in a way that feels like it's, it's matching with his character from the comics. Cool. So, and Robin Taylor is actually the, one of the best reasons to watch Gotham because he puts... He, his performance kind of carries a lot of episodes. Mm-hmm. Um... So I wanted to point that out, that that character is actually quite different from what you might see. You brought up Danny DeVito earlier, or Burgess, <laughs> Burgess Meredith as well. Um, very different from their portrayals of the Penguin, and yet still undeniably the Penguin. Right. But the Penguin instead that we have in the Telltale series is not the Penguin. It is someone that is given the same name, Oswald mm-hmm, Cobblepot, mm-hmm. and he's supposed to become the Penguin later on, but nothing about his character says penguin yeah, you really first don't of all see it. he has like for some reason like he's he's british like he has a british like like but like not a a um a nobleman accent it's like this weird kind of it's kind of cockney yeah. kind of a cockney like he's like a street a street rat kind of guy mm-hmm. and um also he was he was the best fr- best friends with bruce growing up for some reason like this is all the, the way in the couple the way, yeah so this doesn't none of this really makes a whole lot of sense he also is like this um He's already into, into, like, street crime, but he's not really, like, he has none of that, like, faux aristocratic it's element not a, to it's it. It's not organized crime. He's just a punk. Yeah, and so none of it really matches with 
Well, they talked about it in his like his dossier how he was involved with like arms dealing and stuff like that too. So overseas. Sure. Oh, that, really? Well, yeah. that wasn't in the mainline story. If it I was. had to go read that, no, well, no, no they, they they were reading off his they, dossier. They mentioned they mentioned it, it yeah. slightly, but that's being involved in arms dealing is not. Oh, okay, be, arms dealer. That says the penguin. You know how many people are involved? With, that doesn't mean anything. That's yeah. nothing. So he doesn't. He's a completely original character, which I am not against having original characters in, mm-hmm. in a Batman game or but anything. Don't call him the penguin. But don't call him the penguin, and, yeah. and don't pretend like. It felt like they're trying to check off boxes. Like they're going to go, oop, we got to have the penguin. Oop, or do we, have, do we have a Joker in there? Do we have Riddler? Let's just go down the list. And be like, oh, let's get this guy in there and this guy in there. Catwoman, don't forget Catwoman. Right. Let's Selena just... Kyle, mm-hmm. got to be Catwoman. Yeah. So, and actually, I mean, I, you guys didn't get to the part where later on he actually does appear and he has a mask that looks like a penguin um, when he's like holding up this uh, debate. Yeah, I went through um, and I saw some of that on, because I, I, I tried to go through some Let's Plays. Yeah. I, I skipped around. Mm-hmm. I didn't actually sit there and watch the whole story because, to be honest, I don't think the story is, is worth doing that mm-hmm. with. Uh, I didn't really think the story was very well written, yeah. if I'm being perfectly honest. And I, and I have to be. I mean, I just don't think it was very good. Given a couple of weeks since we played, I now am trying to think back on the actual plot. And I'm like, well, let's see, there was Batman. Um, and then there was that thing with uh, Two-Face. Um, well, there was that thing. It wasn't with, quite yet Two-Face. Right. And there was that thing with, with Selina Kyle, how she gets, she gets into a scrape with Batman as Catwoman, of course. Yeah. And then later on, she just puts together that he's Batman when she's sitting with Bruce Wayne. And Bruce doesn't even deny it. He just goes, oh, yeah, you got me. Yeah. I'm Batman. Well, there, there was a scar that she recognized. Yes, so. but that's, that's absurd. Mm. We're talking about a guy who this is what he does for a living, and he's not even going to put on a little bit of makeup to cover up a scar. Mm. Like, yeah. none of this makes any sense. World's greatest detective, considered one of the smartest people on the planet, and he's been, he's been Batman for quite a while. It's like this is yeah. his first rodeo. And he doesn't even think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and, and talk to, to public figures Maybe I should put some makeup on so it doesn't look like I go outside and like, I'm, I'm involved in a fight club or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, she had the big bruise, so it makes perfect – and it was in the shape of her goggle. So it made perfect sense mm-hmm. that um, – That he would that put it he together. would recognize that she – because that's who He's he also is. the great detective. Exactly. She is just, she's just a cat burglar. But instead of it being this great moment where he's figured it out, it becomes this humiliating moment for Batman where the criminal – Pegs him in about three minutes. Right. Oh, and then also she has his grappling hook and won't give it back. Right. And I'm th- and like we had this whole laugh about this scene because he's, he's got a closet full. He's Batman. Yeah. He's he's got millions and mil- or billions probably, and he can't even. He only has one grappling hook. He's like, uh oh, Catwoman's got my grappling hook. And then the weirdest part was that he agrees. Like they have this like moment. And I forget what it was, but like um, he's yeah, gonna I'll do something you, for her. If she, I'll give you your crime stuff back if you give me my my grappling hook. Right. As what? A, like that doesn't. First of all, he, why would he? Why would he do that? I, Secondly, I think, I why think just that take was, it back from her? That was more. He's Batman. In, in my view, that was more just like securing her cooperation, and the the items were just kind of like an incidental. But he uh, almost a joke. Insert <laughs> some sexual tension into that, and yeah. I might buy it. I would agree with that. And too. then we're no longer talking about a grappling hook. We're talking about a quote unquote grappling hook. Right. Right. That would have made more sense. That would have made the, the more weirdest sense. thing is the weirdest thing about that is that doing something like that. They, they would do that in some of the old, like, 60s Batman even. Oh, like they yeah. Even, they even pulled that off in a show that was campy. And yet here, where there's suppo- it's supposed to be a serious story, it was actually much sillier the yeah, way they handled it. Was. It. it was. So it, it, it really is a testament to the writing, honestly. I mean, we have to say that the writing is, I think, I mean, we had a lot of problems with the gameplay, but I think the writing might have been even worse. Well, I want to go a little more deep with that because you've got two types of writing going on here. You've, yeah, you've got the, that's true. The, the regular writing, like any kind of, let's say, novel or TV show would have. TV show is probably a better comparison because it's dialogue. And then you've got the writing, which is the lateral writing that comes into play within the context of what we assume is a telltale story that is an interactive story and therefore is going to have parallel scenes that change based upon the variables. And I didn't see evidence of that. What I saw was, did you get through this scene or not? Yes. Okay, move to the next hallway. Okay, did you get through this scene or not? Yes, move to the next hallway. What would have been really cool is if we could have had some kind of meaningful way to uh, interact with Catwoman where you can end the scene where, wow, that was like the – that was filled with innuendo versus, well, okay, it was all business here, you know, and, and something in between. And that goes back to one of the things when they first announced this Batman game. Mm-hmm. This, this was a few years back. Um, and I remember I was talking with, uh, I think actually it might have been on one of the shows too, where I was talking with uh, Richard and, and Chris maybe, or maybe it was Doc and I forget, it was, it's been a while since we've, we've had this show. But, and I was talking about how they could do the, the narrative choice in an interesting way because mm-hmm. Batman has been 
reimagined so many times. Everybody's yeah, that, that, that was on the show. We talked about, yeah, like, yeah. are you going to be this type of Batman, this type of Batman, or this type of Batman? Yeah, which could have been, and that's kind of sort of a little bit what you're talking that's about here. That's kind of what I'm talking about. You could have approached it in a, oh, they have this kind of um, game of, of cat and mouse or cat and bat, yeah. I guess, cat where they're bat. kind of this doing this kind of back and forth, um, heavily flirtatious interaction mm-hmm. versus a serious... Um, grim kind of view of Batman where, yeah. like, no, he's going to get it. He's going to get what he wants because he's Batman. You better just yeah. deal with it kind of situation. And so that would have been a lot more interesting way to handle it. Instead, yeah. no matter what choice you make, you, you kind of come off as, across as a punk. Yeah, seriously. Or an incompetent. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I'm, you know, I'm not a huge fan of, say, love triangles as a story, just generally as a setup. You know, everything becomes Archie and Betty and Veronica at that point. And it's just like, oh, okay, we're doing a love triangle. But... This was a perfect love triangle moment. It really, mm-hmm. really was. You had Batman. You had, uh, you know, was it Vicky? Is that right? No, Vicky Vale. Vicky Vale. And then you had Selena Kyle. And you, you could actually end the game deciding which of those two you were going to be, quote, unquote, in love with. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe they did that. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Chris, you could tell us. So, and yeah, this is actually, I wanted to also mention, you know, sort of going back to the Penguin, that later on, you start, he starts to become more traditionally Penguin, because he takes over Wayne Enterprises, basically, as the puppet for the organization that's trying to, like, really take down Batman. Um, and so, you know, they talk about, like, oh, yeah, he's got business credentials, and his family is, you know, known for their business and stuff like that. And so he sort of takes over as the interim and then eventually like the official CEO of Wayne Enterprises. Yeah, but Wayne. none of that is like Penguin. Mm-hmm. Everything you just said is more like Lex Luthor. Like you basically just said that he's <laughs> he's not Penguin, he's just Lex Luthor with a Cockney accent. And so and this is what I was going to talk about, you know, the, the difference I think between the two of us is I don't know the Batman mythos well enough. They like this different take on the Penguin. If you've seen any, but if you, but you've seen other takes on the Penguin and not, this is like none of them. I just know that he's he's a guy with the suit that has a lot of money. It's kind of like the No, 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 no. no. That's 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 that describes like tons of characters in comics. That what you just said also describes Tony Stark, mm-hmm. describes Lex Luthor, it yeah. describes it describes Bruce Wayne. Sure. So like you're you're not really distilling the character. And by so and, that. and so what I'm wondering is if maybe they took some liberties because they wanted it to be different enough from any other Batman thing that they felt like they had freedom to take the story where they but wanted. But why? Why yeah, did they feel no like point. they needed to be different from Batman? This is the first time we've ever gotten to be Batman in an interactive dialogue space. Right. So what the last thing you want to do is in reinvent Batman. And by that, I mean the entire world of right. Batman. It, what you want to do is you want to embrace everything that Batman has ever been and then give the players the choices so they can decide how, quote-unquote, dark knight they want to be. Sure. You know what I'm C- saying? Compare, compare it to the, to the way that Rocksteady handled the Arkham games. And they, re, they actually did have their own adaptations, their own versions of fair, Batman villains. Like yeah. it, weren't just, it wasn't the exact same thing. Like, like their version of the Scarecrow became iconic. Like they had, but it was still it was still the That's scarecrow. True. It was still the 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 crazed psych- psychiatrist who's obsessed with fear and develops the fear toxins and all that. Mm-hmm. But their take on him with you know like the um, the syringe the syringe nail gloves and all right. that kind of stuff. They went in this direction with it that um, and, and the way that he like puts Batman in this giant hallucination hallucinatory, hallucinatory world or uh, that's that's probably a word. Sure, we'll go with <laughs> it. Um, that became a part of that character, you know. Yeah. So. That was that was an inter- a clever way to go with it, or like the way that they that they took Killer Croc, for example, mm-hmm. the way that they they handled mm-hmm. Croc mm-hmm. was differently different from how they did it in the comics, but it was still Croc. Mm-hmm. Like it still felt like Killer Croc, but was also different from the way they did it in say the Batman animated series. Oh yeah, but it was still Croc. That was my Batman. Right, the Batman animated series in the '90s was my Batman, which I was also the Batman school. from the '70s, by the way. Well, of course it was, but I, the base I came, yeah. but I came home, and you know that's that was I watched no, but I'm, every I'm with day. you. But, but my point is that I'm not against these other interpretations. I'm saying that you need to, like, like Doc is saying, you have to respect the source material. Otherwise, why are you not just writing an original story? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or, or, just, or, or if you're like, okay, we have this story for this character. He's going to you know, have this, this connection with Bruce Wayne as a kid, and, but he's going to have this animosity towards him. And uh, they grew up together, have animosity, and then he's going to come back and he's going to try to take down Batman. Mm-hmm. These are all interesting traits for a character. Gee, I wonder if, there, if, if only there was a comic book character that has those exact same traits. Oh, yeah, Hush. That whole character of Hush, that's this whole thing. He was invented by Paul Dini in the comics short, like a little bit after he did the Batman um, animated series. He did mm-hmm. some. He wrote for the comics for a few years. I didn't know that. That's and he cool. invented this new, this new Batman villain. That, that, and I say new, but is it, he was invented in the 2000s, so relatively right, yeah. new for Batman. 
known as Hush, who was also a um, surgeon. His, his family knew the, the, knew the Waynes. I forget the, his real name. Mm-hmm. But his family knew the Waynes. Exa- almost the exact same story that you have the backstory for, for Penguin, by the way. Mm-hmm. Almost the exact same backstory. Almost the exact same mm-hmm. stuff happens. And yet, instead, they just go... Well, we can't use that character for some weird reason. Let's just call him the Penguin. Well, probably because no one's heard of Hush. So maybe, but, maybe but they, they were going but with Hush. But Batman fans have, though, is yeah. the thing. So that, and, and for the fans that haven't, like mm-hmm. you, you wouldn't have cared. Yeah. So it's like there's no reason not to use that character. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make any sense to do what they did, is, is my point. Mm-hmm. Well, let me throw my Batarang out here and see if it comes back. Here's my, here's my overall description of what Batman as a franchise is. Okay, Batman as a franchise is about Arkham. Ultimately, it, it's everything that goes into and comes out of Arkham. And here's why I say this. Because the crazy defines the character. Oh, yeah. Both yeah, good true. and bad. Mm-hmm. Every single character is defined by their psychosis. Yeah. What, what, is, what, is, their, what is their obsession? What yes. are they obsessed with? What do they have to do? And they all have, they all have their... their, their they're, they're quirks. Mm. They all are psychologically damaged. That includes Batman, including by the way. That Batman. includes Batman. Thank you. So they all have their their what and, and but and including the Robins too. All of the Robins well, of had had severe psych, psych, uh, woman, psychiatric all or psychological it. issues. So it's very true. That's very true. And then when you take someone like the Penguin the and penguin. you strip out all of the all of his uh, his traits mm-hmm. and then you just kind of give him this whole different kind of slant for the character. That's, yeah. Someone else entirely. Yeah. The fundamental thing behind the Penguin is he was made fun of, and he took the thing that he was being made fun of and turned it into scary. But anyway, that we're focusing too much on this one character. I just think in general that that's a flaw of the game to not recognize what they're making. Yes. Like, make the, like what was that quote? Make the game that you're... Make, make the game that you're making. Right. Yeah, that's Tim Schafer. Right. Thank you. Uh, you. You said that quote before. I like the quote. Yeah. It's a good quote. But um, I'll to quickly kind of summarize what happens yeah, for you guys sure. since you guys didn't see it. And this kind of goes back to your question about Vicky and um, Selena. Um, oh, is Vicky revealed to be the Joker? Oh, I knew it. No, <laughs> I knew it. No, she's Robin. But but not not you're not too far off though. So the the children oh, of Arkham kind of become God. like the the big organization that is like trying to take down Batman and to change Gotham or whatever. Uh-huh. They're behind the revolution that Cobblepot's talking about. Um, and it turns out that the leader of this organization is actually Vicki Vale, uh, because her parents, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, like, um, because you find out that Bruce's dad, um, was heavily involved in, like, you know, turning people insane through drugs and stuff like that to keep them locked away in Arkham Asylum. So in order to deal with them, rather than killing them, he'd make them insane. Does that end up being true? Yes. That doesn't make, okay, again. That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. You're taking, you're taking, like, characters that have a certain Mm storyline, a certain background, and you're, you're... Let's let's address let's address the, that reveal by the way with mm-hmm. the whole Batman's father and like mm-hmm. his connection to this. The whole purpose behind the like Batman like it goes back to why is he psychologically da- why is he damaged yeah. and and why does he have this obsession because it goes back to a pointless act of violence. Mm-hmm. Yes, he, he his family were walking down Crime Alley at night. Of course, terrible mistake. We've uh-huh. been over, and they are accosted by a mugger, and his father bravely tries to. Yeah, and stupidly, but bravely, tries to defend his, his family and ends up getting shot, yeah. and so does the mother. So they end up both dying. Senseless act of violence. This game changes it to, A, the father is actually this you know piece of crap criminal, mm-hmm. and B, he also is assassinated. Yeah, he got what he deserved. So it's, and yeah, he kind of he kind of had it coming, and it was, a, it was a hit. It wasn't a random act of violence. Right. The whole purpose behind ba- Batman's, Batman's whole goal is... He's a kid that lost his parents to senseless violence. Yeah. He doesn't want to see any other kids lose their parents that way. So that is why he became Batman. Mm-hmm. So they're taking so they're basically destroying the entire reason that he is Batman. Mm-hmm. And if you're going to do that, you better have a damn good story that you're telling. It okay. better be top cuz you're basically turning on its head mm-hmm. this character that's been around for a long well, time. And even in even the parts that you guys saw, he was conflicted over like, you know, why are we doing this if it turns out that this is the reason behind sure, it. Sure, that's but, not enough. But that is not enough at all. Well, and it comes up later on where like he he kind of has to like find his reason for being Batman, so he's kind of Vicky as the person who's leading the children. <laughs> that's another Arkham. ridiculous yeah. one too. Sure. Yeah. She's but, just a reporter. So, obviously what they're doing is they're... Lois Lane is secretly Lex Luthor. They're, yeah. They're, she pulls off her hair. Ah, I've been Lex all the time, Superman. Well, following <laughs> that comparison, that makes about as much sense as, as us discovering Superman was actually a psychotic killer the whole time. i got to be honest with you, though. 
it turning out that, Le- that Lois Lane has actually been Lex Luthor this whole time, that would be a brilliant plot by Lex. He might actually do that. <laughs> like, well, I could see Lex pulling that one off. Well, considering all the crossovers that they've done <laughs> yeah. with the, uh, the real Superman and the, uh, the Elseworlds stuff, right, man, right. That's, that's something else. That, no, we're not even going there. <laughs> so, so clearly they took some pretty big risks and decided that we're going to change up a lot of what people know about Batman so that it is this new experience in this game. And at least in your guys' view, it seems like that was a terrible idea. Well, they shouldn't it, have done that. It failed. My point is, because <laughs> people have done things like that in the comics. There was like a whole sure. run in the comics with the Court of Owls. Mm-hmm. Court of Owls apparently is not involved in this at all. I think we talked about that at one yeah. point on the podcast. Because the court, a big part of the Court of Owls was trying to uncover the, the relationship between um, the Wayne family and if they had a connection to organized crime and that kind of thing. This is why I thought they were going to go down this route. But the comics handles it in a really clever and respectful way, and it all makes sense within the context of what you know about Batman and the mythos. Mm-hmm. It does change some things, but it makes sense, and it's also well-written. If you're going to do, it, do something like this, one, you still, have to know, you still have to know it's a Batman story first and foremost. You can't just pretend like, oh, a whole bunch of stuff never happened. Uh, just roll with it, guys. You can't do that. And two, you, it has to be well-written so that when people, people are will, willing to accept that change – because of how well it fits in with everything yeah. else. And in this case, I mean, you, you saw us playing the game. We were we were having trouble even, you know, paying attention to it because we were kind of laughing at it. I mean, it's like yeah. the dialogue wasn't written very well. The events that were happening weren't really very engaging. The lateral decisions weren't there. And the lateral decisions weren't there. And so just all in all, to me, the game felt a lot like a failure. And, and episode one, which I do agree was mm-hmm. the strongest, mm-hmm. um, we played through, I think, uh, we about played halfway through, through three. Was about as far as we got. No, we maybe got not halfway. Not quite halfway through two. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So, but I, and I went back and I watched some of the let's plays and I didn't get. To, I kind of skipped around too. Mm-hmm. Um, but one did feel like there is. It, it was the strongest, I guess. Mm-hmm. But also that I think was just because they had they had some ideas. They put them in there, and they added a lot of like mystery to make you think. Oh, I gotta I gotta see where this goes. So I buy buy more of it. I don't know if they even knew where it was going to go. They just wanted to throw in a bunch of things that were like mysterious and twi- and possible twists and kind of kind of whet your appetite. I without actually kind of considering the ramifications of it, I guess is the best way to. Put it. I think they they knew where they were going with it. I just don't think it was executed super great that because could be it. once you get to the end of the series, like you can see where there were closing loops and all this different stuff. Um, and there's definitely a theme of like why is Batman Batman? And also, like, what it is, what is it that he wants to be? Um, because, like, kind of what ends up happening, and it's been a while since I played it, so I don't remember the details, but broadly speaking, it kind of comes down to Vicky Vale is the, the Batman, but opposite. And so, like, if Batman went down a different path, that's her. And so he's kind of struggling internally with what it is that he's that's, trying to be. That's the Hush character. Mm-hmm. They basically took the Hush character and, and split him into Oswald Cobble, Cobblepot and Vicky Vale. Mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm not even. I'm not. Mm-hmm. Sure. I'm not exaggerating. That's actually what they did. Why didn't they just use that character? It's actually well written. No, it was. Me. Yeah. That doesn't make any yeah. sense. As, as, and then trying to pigeonhole like two characters with completely different motivations. I, I have a thought, and you know, you, you said that like you know, it wouldn't matter to people like me who don't know the Batman. Right. Exactly. Because, you would just think it's cool. Hush. You're like you're like because he has a pretty cool design. Like, hey, cool new villain. You know. Yeah. Like exactly. Kind of, um, and I think that, that probably would have been the better route to take. But I think that part of it is that they wanted to use characters that were iconic and were well known, even if you don't really but, know the character. But you can't do that if you're not using what makes them iconic. Mm-hmm. That's the problem. Like I get, I mean, I, I see what you're saying. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that is a justification. So like I, I I've heard that, of Penguin, even if I don't know who Penguin is. I haven't heard of Hush. And so when they're yes. saying like, oh yeah, it's it's Batman game and it's got all the characters, but, it's got Penguin. But it's what got is so-and-so. iconic about Penguin? Like what's iconic about him? I just know that Penguin's a Batman villain. No no no. But what? But you. But don't say you don't know. You do know. I, I don't know. Yes you do. Because I, I tried telling you and then you corrected me. No 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 no. Actually think about <laughs> it. What what what? what I Batman, described Hush. What Batman media have you seen? <laughs> Any I, of them. Have you seen Batman Returns? Have you seen the old Batman animated, animated I, series? Most, have you seen? I'm most familiar with the Dark Knight trilogy. Okay. And I've seen a little bit of the Arkham. And you played the Arkham, some of the Arkham games. I played the first Arkham game. Right. So you, so, so you have some familiarity with the character, mm-hmm. and you probably have seen some little like YouTube clips or something. Think about it. It's like, it's the umbrella. It's the you know the the, no, the like the nose, nose or the yeah. monocle, mm-hmm. the the aristocratic look, the dress. 
he but looks, also the weird the weird way of like walking and comporting himself. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, he looks like the guy from Monopoly. Right. Yeah. That's what that's what that's what is money, iconic money about it. If you're talking about like recognizable mm-hmm. traits, just like Joker, what are and, his and later what are on, his recognizable traits? Well, he's and, got the clown yeah. makeup. He's got. I'm, I'm not even talking about his character. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm literally what what makes him iconic. What are the visual and clues? The visual hints of the penguin come in later in the game, and you just haven't. Seen so that it makes yet. sense. If but you said no. Hold on. You said it was a mask. There was a mask, and at one point, one of the eyes gets punched out, so there is just one eye on the mask. Later on, he's wearing kind of like this. AR device yeah, that's, that's like a monocle. Again, that also, that's terrible. <laughs> that's terrible. Yeah, I, I'll need, I, I, I would say I need to play it, but I don't want to play it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about crowd play, because we haven't talked much about the actual crowd play mechanic we, much. We did some. Yeah, let's, let's finish um, up with some crowd play talk. Yeah, because uh, the thing that struck me about the crowd play is it seemed kind of pointless. Um, and I, I liked what you said earlier, Jim, about Mystery Science Theater 3000. Right. Because it was kind of fun to, to be in the room and see what you guys were recommending get done, and then you were out voting me sometimes, and, mm-hmm. and that was kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I liked it or not. Um, again, the agency was being taken away because, well, keeping in mind uh, who the guys in the room were, uh, sometimes the stupider things were getting chosen, mm-hmm. uh, the funny thing was getting chosen, uh, that kind of a thing. So it is one of those things where... I just pulled up a picture for those that don't know of the uh, yeah. That's why I'm of stumbling penguin, here. I'm like, oh, of the penguin no. uh, uh, mask mm. doesn't look. It looks more like a dodo bird. First it of all, does, yeah. that's horrible. I'm sorry. Maybe, maybe it's a puffin. I'm gonna have to say well, it could be a puffin. The, the puffins are technically anyway, I, I, water birds. Yes, Arctic water yes. birds. So it's uh, but, the great Batman villain, the puffin. I like it. I like it. I See, like this it. would work. That would work. See, I'd be fine with that because that's a new villain. Yeah, totally. So would have been written badly because yeah, this game's written exactly. badly. But no, but but continue what we're anyway, saying with crowd play. So the, yeah. the point is this: you get enough people in a room, especially if it's semi-anonymous and has that sort of internet-y feel, um, you're not going to get serious answers. You're not going to get center, serious interactions. Mm-hmm. What you're going to get is a bunch of uh, sort of joking responses, and then Batman's going to come off as a complete uh, either either psychopath. Or just ridiculous, not in, in, ignoble character. You know what I'm saying? And I, th- I think my biggest problem with the crowd play, and this is something we talked about earlier in the mm-hmm, episode, mm-hmm. is that when it came down to actually making meaningful decisions, a lot of times the crowd didn't get a say. Right. And so what we were really doing yeah. was just defining what Bruce said, but not what he did. And in so, terms of mechanics of things. That, that would happen. be the first thing I would fix in any future crowd play, is make sure that everyone actually has a say in stuff that matters. I stuff think, that happens. Yeah. Right. I think you could... You could Go, you know, line for line, like a, a, if in one of your courses, for example, Doc, when you, yeah. teach, you could write an entire, an entire paper and turn it in just on what's wrong with the way they use, oh, the way they, well, their gameplay in, in this Batman game and how to fix it. That's it dissertation be, material. Yeah, right there, it, I mean, it could be massive. Yeah, I mean, somebody could take um, and, and map the, just this Batman game mm-hmm. alone, and then you probably dip into some of the others, and that, that's dissertation material. Yeah. But um, what, what really was the final nail in the coffin for me personally well, on the day, I went ahead and I looked up because I, I had heard crowd play was supposed to be this thing where um, you could use it for streaming. I had heard that it was supposed to have thousands of people. I had heard that it was going to be this big deal. It was the next generation in interactive uh, entertainment, all this stuff. And then I found the uh, Telltale, and this is at Telltale.com, okay? So, I mean, this is literally their own website, the description of what crowd play is. And the very first word on the website is updated mm-hmm. in brackets and that's got to tell you something okay yeah the fact that that their original plan didn't happen um through testing through other things etc local multiplayer option coming to telltale introducing crowd play and it says there's update there's been a lot of excitement over crowd play this week there's also been a lot of questions we wanted to take a moment to clarify some things about this exciting new feature being introduced in batman the telltale series and basically, the question is, what is crowd play? And, and this is just a little tiny part of the whole thing. Crowd play allows people watching the same screen to vote on game choices using mm-hmm. their own devices. People that you invite watch along and vote, tailoring the story together as you play together. Crowd play is designed for 4 to 12 players. What? So there was a scandal here. Um, and I don't know if it was just bad design, bad research, um, realizing after the fact that, that what they wanted to do they couldn't do but what most people don't realize is that whenever something is streaming there's a pretty significant delay yeah. of two or three seconds even and that's enough for your vote not to be able to be counted and not to matter mm-hmm. in the context of the game 
Um, so, you know, I can immediately think of a fix for this. If it's, are you streaming yes, no as an option, then what it does is it kicks out the timer. You know how there's a timer that ticks down? Uh-huh. It kicks out the timer to about 10 seconds. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, you've got that awkward, weird moment where Batman's just kind of standing there, swaying back and forth, waiting for you to make a decision. Mm-hmm. But that's okay, because the purpose then becomes, Adjusting his hey, mm-hmm. you know, this is on Twitch, we get it, and everybody's laughing and doing the thing, and, and you've got all the... You just you time shifted in that way. Boom! Just fixed your problem, Telltale. You can send me a check. <laughs> but that wasn't that wasn't what they were wanting to do or trying to do, and so they they haven't done that. I think really the crowd play was meant for. They've done these things where whenever a new series comes out, they'll actually go to a theater and have people come and like watch the sure. playthrough. Sure. And so I think the idea is so that when people are in those theaters, they can all contribute to that playthrough. And you know as what? As long as there's sounds... only twelve people in the theater. <laughs> because it's well, flatly said, it's still, well, it's made for four twelve. Lower down, it says that it can accommodate up to a thousand, um, and I think it actually says a thousand or more, which that's ambiguous. Um, but what it really comes down to is this: there comes a point, much past around four, where your vote really doesn't matter. Because mm. um, if there are only four choices and there are five people in the room, and to, you know everybody chooses a different thing, then the one person who's the tiebreaker is really the one making the decision. And so there's a, there's a flaw, I think in this idea of collaborative storytelling in this way. I would much rather see something along the lines of Catwoman is talking now. Jim is playing as Catwoman. Hmm. What does she say? Yeah. I think something along those lines is what crowd play needs to be. Or, or like a, like a, you know, I'll, like, like those games that you would play where you'd start telling a story and you'd pass it off to someone else. Yeah. And they'd continue that story, then they'd pass it off. And yeah. like, you have a little bit of, of agency while you're the one telling the story. Mm-hmm. What you just said about Catwoman actually reminds me of a thing that I did in an experimental game lab back in college oh, yeah? where I had a two-player dialogue system. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's a really cool idea, and oh, I'd yeah, love to I see them do that. it. It's extremely hard to write. Of course, <laughs> of course it is. And, you know, <laughs> we've, we've well, done stop, the visualizations. Well, stop playing it safe, Telltale. That's your problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, I think that's, that's really what happened here is that this crowd play got shoehorned in after the fact. This was not a game made for for. Crowdplay. Yeah. It's a game that was made, and then crowdplay was added. I really think that's what happened. And I think the oddest thing that, about this game, too, um, is that it really does feel like a Telltale formula, formulate Telltale game. We're going to play it safe with what we're doing gameplay-wise. But yet, with the Batman story, they decided to change things up. Mm-hmm. Did, like You're focusing on the wrong things. If you're going to get the Batman property, that's where you want to play it safe. Yeah. You want to actually, in your gameplay, that's where you want to, okay, how can we make this game work within the Batman context? Yeah. Not how do we make Batman work for our, sto- our yeah. like, storytelling system. Well, and, and I'll pick on you just a little bit, Chris, and say I wonder if you would feel exactly the same way if some of the other Telltale games had taken liberties. Mm. You know what I mean? Like Borderlands, for example. Because I know that's one of your favorite mm-hmm. properties. Well, and I think that they did the smart thing of making it more about the side characters. They came yeah. up with new characters for this game. That's a and that's great response. exactly what I said they should have done that's with, yeah. with that yeah. Oswald Colorpot character. Yeah. Just but, make it a new character. But the world was consistent, mm-hmm. yeah. and the characters were new, and mm-hmm. there were a few cameos. But the cameos mm-hmm. were Brief spot and, on. Yeah. They nailed those cameos. I think, and I think to your point, Jim, like maybe the, the difference between us is I was okay with the different takes on the Batman villains because I know that there are so many different takes on them before. It's just that it seems like we're kind of focusing on different things as far as what's okay to change and what's I, not. I think part of it is that you just don't know anything about the Penguin. I didn't realize how little you knew. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, you couldn't even name the Umbrella. Well, or like the, I mean, I'm like, name something iconic about him and you're if like... You, you, you were asking me, I was thinking more of like character traits. Uh, if I was naming things like iconic items and stuff yeah. like that, it's like, oh yeah, it's character design, it's blank. Yeah. Because I, I've recognized a lot of the characters by sight, I just don't know their stories. That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. Anyway. All right, well, I think so, we've, we've so, kind of talked ourselves yeah, we, we out talked, with this one. We, we talked a lot about, like, you know, kind of what the what the story had issues with. We talked a little bit about the gameplay issues. Overall, you know, I think we, we could keep going for a while and really get in-depth, but I think the takeaway is that, you know, it, it was, you know, having played all the way through it myself, um, you know, it, it had some interesting ideas and it did a few things that were kind of cool, but for the most part, I was pretty disappointed with it. Mm. Um, and this is even as someone who's, like, very willing to forgive a few of Telltale's flaws, um, yeah. it, it was it was pretty much a disappointing uh, experience, I have to say. One batarang out of ten. <laughs> wow, it was very disappointing. Well, given that the that, Telltale that devs didn't even come are back. big yeah. fans of the show, Bring, get, make it come. Uh, Telltale, please send your rebuttals to inbox at backward-compatible.com. 
And we will, of course, read your letter on the air. Yeah, there actually, we would. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, Rowan, for joining us for episode number 97 of the backward compelpacom podcast, our roundtable on Telltale's Batman. I'm Chris. I'm Batman. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show, because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com. And we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible.